Welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, science fiction, and horror novels. I'm Evan. And I'm Chad. And today you're joining us for our recap of chapters 1 through 29 of Jade War, book 2 in the Green Bones Saga. Ah, oh, man, this is such a good book. It really is. I'm enjoying it page by page. I think about it when I'm at work, which is one of my biggest marks indicators of a good book is whether or not I want to read it when I'm not reading it. And I do. And I got to say, as good as this is, I think it is suffering just like a tiny bit of I know sequ- exactly. <laughs> yeah. sequelitis. It's just just a tiny bit. And it's not as bad as other trilogies that I've read. And we're starting a little bit further ahead than I thought we would. There are a ton of moving pieces on this board, and I'm able to keep track of all of them, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's more complicated than the first book. The first book kind of felt like checkers, and this book kind of feels like chess. Yeah, but like, I, I hate to use this word because it's not, I, I want to say boring chess and be lazy, but it's not boring. It's just, it's classic second book in a trilogy problem. It's setting everything up. Yes. But... I feel we are getting the components for a really awesome third book. Well, and we did half the book this time, right? So I think toward the end of this half, I could really feel things really starting to escalate. Mm-hmm. So I w- I knew the whole time it was going to be great. <laughs> Me too. Full confidence. I just got a little lost sometimes, you know, it's like we're, we're being introduced to a bunch of new characters and not only new characters, but different regions of the world. New nations. Yeah, they were like pretty inconsequential in the first part, in the first book where like we had we had heard of them, but they didn't really matter too much to like this one conflict going on in the streets of Jan Loon. And now we've expanded way outside the streets of Jan Loon. But it's cool because these characters are so excellent that we're seeing all of this unfold through their eyes. And now that we've had a whole book and, you know, kind of a book and a half to get to know these people, it's so much fun to see their reactions and see how they're going to deal with certain things that are coming up. I totally agree. Yeah, there's a we were getting a very granular A-B story in the first book. This family was fighting that family for honor and for Jade. And yeah, there was some other things happening that we heard about and some mentions, but they weren't important in any huge way. And now all of a sudden we zoomed way back. We've got the whole world in play now. Like this book kind of feels like epic fantasy now. Yeah. I yeah, think that's exactly. the best way to put it probably. It's mm-hmm. like the first yeah, book was... Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, the first book was fantasy. You know, it's like urban fantasy and now it's epic fantasy. So with that, let's go right into our first synopsis. All right. Sixteen months after the events of Jade City, the two major clans of Jan Loon are licking their wounds. War has broken out between Shatar and Igatan over the disputed Ortoko region, with Espenia, Kikan's ally, supporting Shatar. The book begins with Barrow and Mutt robbing Kal Lan's grave with the help of Nuno, a groundskeeper. The boys steal Lan's jade and kill Nuno before leaving the cemetery. Hilo and Shay attend the funeral of Kal Sen, the torch of Kikan. Doru is present with the Mountain Clan. Back at the Call estate, Hilo is informed that a distant cousin of the Call family is being held on the Uwiwa Islands by a man named Zapanyo, a jade smuggler. Hilo then asks Andin one last time to swear his allegiance to No Peak. When Andin refuses, Hilo informs him he's being sent to Espenia to go to school. Shea struggles with her role as weatherman and begins dating a teacher named Mero. She has been leaning on her second-in-command, Woon, and her master luckbringer, Hami. Hilo assumes that the stranger that stole Lan's jade is the same as the one that killed his brother. He orders Make Tar to renew his search for Barrow. Tar interrogates the goateed Greenbone in the employ of the Mountain Clan, but the Greenbone takes his own life before Tar has a chance to gain any information. Barrow is offered a job smuggling Jade, making much more money than he is at present, and he accepts. Wen, now pregnant with Hilo's child, discovers the letter from Kal Lan's ex-wife, Eni, the one he decided not to read before he died. The letter says Lan has a newborn son named Nicholas. Hilo asks Ren to write to Eni, inquiring about the baby. Hilo travels to the Uiwa Islands to fetch his cousin. Upon arrival, Zapanyo offers No Peak a cut of the profits of the Jade Black Market, but Hilo refuses. 
He takes his cousin away, and they escape the islands after being accosted by the police. Andon arrives in Port Massey, Espania, and begins his studies, staying with a Kikinese family called the Hians. The Pillars of Mountain Clan and No Peak meet once more and settle an uneasy truce. They hold a press conference and announce the jade mining will continue once more, and additional resources will be committed to combating jade smuggling. Wen receives a reply from Eni, telling her not to write again. Hilo decides to head to Steppenland to confront Eni about his brother's son. Shea visits Doru at the village he has been assigned to. She has come to kill the old weatherman, but finds she's unable to do so. Doru tells Shea that there are other clans loyal to the mountain that have their eyes on the future vacancy of the position of Pillar, since Aitmata has no planned successor or children. Doru instructs Shea to use this weakness to Nopik's advantage, and then shoots himself. Wen frequents the Celestial Radiance, a women's tea shop in the Sogen district. She speaks with some of her white rats and obtains the schedule of the mountain's new weatherman, as well as information on the other families loyal to the mountain clan. A nice beginning to the uh, the book, I think. Yeah, um, we you know there was a big time jump, uh, so Call Sen is dead. It, it made sense. Like when I read that, mm-hmm. I was like, "Yeah, he's pretty, pretty much he needs to go. There's really nothing yeah, else he yeah. can do." I mean, the only thing he was really doing before was berating Hilo. <laughs> he was just used as like a emotional jumping point for Hilo to be like, Rah! "Yeah," and Hilo's kind of grown past that anyway, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, like it wouldn't even matter if he's still alive. Like Hilo's been pillar for long enough. He would just shrug it off. Yeah, so it makes sense. It's interesting that. Barrow was so calculating. You were kind of right in that last episode that we had. It kind of mentions, it's like a one sentence thing, but it kind of mentions that Barrow had been back to Land's grave a couple times. Yeah. There was like a one sentence thing there where, you know, it kind of mentions that Barrow had come back to the gravesite a couple different times, but it just wasn't quite right. And so now he's ready to rob this place. He's got the groundskeeper involved and then they kill him. And it was just so much more calculating. Like, Barrow is just, you you totally nailed it. He's just a lot more on the ball. Yeah, well, thank you. And to use your line, his game has moved from checkers to chess. Right. Like, he's just be like, I'm going to jump this guy and take his jade. Now he's like, okay, let's think about this because I've had so many brushes with death. I can't continue to have cat-like nine lives. No, and, you know, like, his luck is eventually going to run out. <laughs> yeah. He does seem to have genuinely really good luck it seems or at least incredible um like intermittently good luck and bad luck he has great luck and terrible decision making right yeah i mean he's just he really wants to get ahead Mm -hmm. one thing i did notice is that we're we're really jumping forward in strange increments in time did you notice that yeah i did and confusingly presented chunks of time sometimes i'm kind of left wondering like okay how much time just passed then yeah it'll say like so three months later we're doing this and you're like oh right. okay three months later and then it's like okay then no two weeks later we do this and then two weeks later we do this and so it is jumping a little bit i'm not really having trouble keeping up in those small instances but i am having trouble kind of remembering in total how much time has passed between mm-hmm. events so i mean obviously i understand that within the confines of a chapter when it says two weeks later i understand that it's two weeks later there was a point where I was reading where it was like the street war between the clans two years ago. And I remember yeah. thinking, oh, two, okay, yeah, I guess two years. That's the exact trouble I'm having too, is adding up all of the small little chunks. And fortunately, she does remind us from time to time. I even had in my notes looking back, it was like, thank you, Fonda, for reminding us that a full year has passed. I have a question. Yeah. Do we know who the goateed Greenbone is? Is his name ever given to us? The, the the guy that was initially giving Barrow those jobs, I think he, w- he was the one that told Barrow to go shoot up the Lilac Divine in the Mutt's first book. Dad? No, not Mutt's, Mutt's dad. Not Mutt's dad. Um, the Greenbone oh. that's interrogated by one of the Make Brothers that cuts his own oh, throat. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, his name was Seiko. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I remember that. It was just weird to me that, like, why not have him be somebody that's named that was part of the mountain clan you know what i mean it's just it Mm -hmm. it just it made me feel like i i didn't know who it was and he he was a player in the first book 
from almost like the beginning or at least the middle of yeah. the first book. So I just thought that was weird. I thought that um, maybe I just maybe I just skimmed over it or something. <laughs> kind of took you back to your uh, Lycanius days. You're like, am I supposed to know something <laughs> that I don't know? <laughs> yeah, but in this case, I, I just should have paid attention to what name it was. There's a lot of names. There's a lot of names. And, you know, you just corrected me when we were talking before this episode that I was using the names in the incorrect order. Right. You know, yeah. I would always say the first name, last name, but you say the family name first and then. But that scene was really, really cool where he's hanging there and then he brings, apparently he like brought his foot up and then grabbed the knife and then pulled himself up, even though he didn't have his jade and cut his own throat. Yeah. Like working that hard to kill yourself. Wow. Ugh. Yeah. That was pretty gruesome. And the yeah. way that the, one of them, I think it was Mike, uh, make tar. The way that he figured out that he because he went into a different room and then he mm -hmm. he like sensed this elevated heart rate yeah i think he steps outside to smoke oh man yeah and i liked his he was like sometimes people just need a few minutes to remember you totally. know totally <laughs> that was pretty cool. and uh <laughs> the make yeah. the make brothers are like such edge lords they're great <laughs> edge lords <laughs> they're i love so that great uh it did point out a cool a weakness kind of that the green bones have in that they don't really put any clout behind non jade weapons, right? Like they right. took all of his green weapons and then he was like, ah, he's inert, no weapons. And no, he wasn't. Yeah. And he couldn't get any more information out of him, which, mm -hmm. you know, and Hilo was already frustrated with that situation. Uh, the the make brothers are really interesting because we didn't get a whole lot of light shed on them in the first book even though they're in the first chapter you know i mean we we got yeah. some we got some information on their relationship to Hilo, but i still feel like you know make ken is kind of has his own chapters in this book and i still don't feel like i really know him you know he's the horn of no peak and i'm just i'm not getting like a ton of backstory here like he thinks about how he's going to propose to his fiance or his his girlfriend and stuff and we're getting some of that but he still feels like a fairly flat character like make tar seems to be a little bit more hot-headed mm -hmm. but i don't know maybe we'll see we'll see how they develop i always get him confused as to yeah. which one is which and to which one was the one that did things in the first book yeah i mean make ken is the horn and make tar has um wound's old job so make tar and make Ken get promoted from fists to make Ken is the horn and make tar is the pillar man. And the pillar man's kind of spy master. I'm not really sure what the pillar man's job <laughs> is. Like, I guess it, he seems to have a little bit more diplomatic of a position. He seems I, like it, uh, Hilo kind of sends make tar out to go like investigate stuff. And then make yeah. Ken is kind of in charge of like, you know, the streets. He's a general. Yeah, exactly. He's in charge of the fists. But it's weird, too, because you've got Shay's helpers, which are Hami and Woon, um, mm -hmm. the Master Luck Bringer and Shadow of the Weatherman, respectively. So Ooh, yeah, well like, done every, on your terms. <laughs> everybody's got different ranks and resp responsibilities and stuff. It is really cool to see kind of the inner workings of all this. It's very well fleshed out. She very much laid it all out for herself and for us. Okay, these are the ranks. This is what everyone does. I would love to see, it would really actually help me being a visual learner to kind of see like a big tree graphic of like at the top you have pillar and then under him you have horn. Right. And, you know, it'd be really helpful to see that laid out. I wonder if that exists. That should exist. Probably in Fonda Lee's notes. Maybe someone we should send her another listening email. listening should draw <laughs> awesome fan art that is the ranking that'd be the tree. lamest fan Send art ever <laughs> no way you could put little characters and stuff like wrapping around it and stuff True. yeah no yeah, yeah. <laughs> chunks of jade um i <laughs> one of the parts that really stuck out to me was and it was a fairly small exchange but i think it was really important was that whole scene on uh Uwiwa, those islands when they're coming back from meeting with that jade smuggler and they run into those police zapuno yeah i think that's the name yeah, they run into those police, and Hilo is more—he's not bothered by it at all. He's just kind of annoyed. <laughs> he's just like, oh, "We're gonna have to kill all these guys." Like, I'm just trying to get on a plane, you know. It's like, high. of course he sends them out to us, and we're going, "Okay, now, oh, yep, they're pulling out their guns. Here we go." And he, and Hilo does this really cool thing where he he just jumps out of the car and runs straight at them to direct all the bullets to himself so that he can deflect all of them because he's really good that at was it so cool and then so 
they kind of deal with all these police and stuff and then they get on the plane and Hilo has a pretty short but really important exchange with Lot who is the son of I think an important fist that was killed in the initial skirmish between Mountain and No Peak right that he's gotten his sights yeah and Lot went to school with Andon and they kind of had that kind of dust up um it was like a page long in the first book and so you know Hilo kind of tells Lot those men weren't your enemies those were our enemies right you know cuz he can tell that this kid is kind of shaken up about having killed somebody he even mm -hmm. lies to him and says you know you only killed the one guy yeah, you only killed one but he yeah. really probably killed two probably and i think that it just really shows how much Hilo cares about the people that are in his employ he really does believe that they're all in this together and he doesn't mm -hmm. and, and you know i think we were really kind of led astray like intentionally with Hilo to believe that he was just this brash hot-headed yeah and he just throws his weight around and doesn't really care about anything and like he's really not like that at no. all he's thoughtful and empathetic he's got a lot more land in him than he thinks he does yeah and a lot of other people thinks that he does too he doesn't get enough credit you know he went out of his way to take the time to think about a fairly lower lowly person in his clan's experience and think about it from his perspective of killing someone for the first time and then to consult with him about it and make him feel a little bit better i think he does a really good job at recognizing the strengths in people and bringing them out yeah and he tried to do that with andon but it didn't work yeah andon kind of has some baggage that was getting in the way and i think that that's maybe one of Hilo's weaknesses is that you know this is apparent in the next section we're going to talk about too but Hilo is still very much married to this kind of conservative idea of like what's proper and what's honorable. And it's going to come back to bite him in the ass eventually. Like it's being, in my opinion, it's being hinted at quite a bit that he's going to have to let some stuff go. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to grow. Well, and he's just going to have to get over this idea of pride that is mm -hmm. so core to what it means to be a green bone and what it means to be a call. And I kind of mentioned this in the podcast before, but all this pride and honor and propriety and stuff, it's like maybe it had its place before. I don't I don't know if it's going to work in every situation. The core principles of it, I think, are, are healthy and still should be remembered and even acted upon and used to lead you someone's path through life. But there's definitely like a toxic masculinity Almost, <laughs> aspect yeah, to it for sure that is quickly dying and probably should be let die <laughs> I mean, look at all the problems it's causing yeah a lot of pride and just like like honor except they've kind of twisted honor to be their own like masculine measuring system it's kind of circumstantial almost yeah <laughs> like yeah like... And like very like hierarchical and not healthy so i have a question um that segues nicely into what you were talking about hilo goes over there to pick up the bum cousin what do we know about the bum cousin is this the first time we met him i was gonna ask that too i mean like do you think that <laughs> i don't think he's gonna i don't think he's really serves any purpose other than to have like i don't think Hilo would have gone over there anyway probably um like he might have but he even he kind of even thinks that you know because uh, zapano kind of offers him you know he's like oh, i'll let you in on this and Hilo's just <laughs> like where's my cousin I've got way yeah. bigger things to deal with than you. Um, so I don't I'm here know. because my cousin needs to go to rehab again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was just Zapano has his whole he has he's kind of starting his own clan, it seems like. Right. His own like fake wannabe clan, but they're really just like jade smugglers trying to be legit. But I think it's important that that was shown, you know, because like we have to yeah. see we have to see the the jade smuggling operation. Like Barrow's a part of it now. We have to have some interaction with that. Right. So, yeah, I don't think that the cousin, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think the cousin. He hasn't been mentioned once he since barely, then. I don't even know where he's living yeah. or anything. He just gets him <laughs> back. He's like, all right, you know. But, I mean, you know, good on him. He saw that his, a family member, even though he totally dislikes him and doesn't think that he's really worth anything, he still was like, okay, let's go get him. Which isn't the right thing to do. Yeah. But you're right. The high point was definitely the fight. Like everything he does, he just goes head on and ah, So cool. Another thing that I really like is what the author is doing with Shay's character as she was almost at the risk of Shay becoming a little OP, like slightly overpowered. She was good at 
everything. Yeah. She was really smart, cunning, logical. She goes into a fight and she's like, man, it's been a long time since I've done this. Turns out she's like elegant, graceful, like whipping around, cutting tendons. Awesome. Dancer level fighter. But now she's struggling a little bit with the leadership and really is leaning on wound, which is both a cool way to develop that their relationship kind of what comes of that and to show a weakness and lack of understanding that she has um, in her own character that she needs to overcome and um, and fix and so it's just it's a cool way of making her not op and being like no 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 she's not good at everything though and i was like perfect nice work wisdom yeah and what happens with her and daru that is kind of it's kind of revisiting the same thing that happened in the last book where you know, she let Doru live. That was a good thing for her to do, but it ended right. up becoming a problem later. But it's it's complicated because because right. she let Doru live, Doru was able to give her the advice to kind of seek out those other families. I think that you, you called that in the last episode. But also, <laughs> because she does that, <laughs> she looks weak in front of the people right. that she's in charge of. And that is a perfect example of the kind of that toxic masculinity right. that needs to go away is like really you're going to lose respect for someone because they didn't have it in them to kill an old helpless man with a knife just for revenge like, yeah like you couldn't get vengeance you're so weak like okay it was kind of honorable what she did <laughs> yeah i i mean I, I thought it was like a pretty strong thing to do i mean to just yeah. like she recognized that this man wasn't a threat to them anymore he's no. living in some remote village this isn't necessary, but he kills himself a, anyway. Um, yeah, it's like an on principle killing. I was not expecting him to finish saying something and then shoot himself in the head. <laughs> like that was a <laughs> that was a very rough couple of sentences right there. However, I did expect him to as soon as he takes off the jade because they've mentioned multiple times like once you're on the jade train, it sucks to not have the jade. And so as soon as he takes it off, I was like, he's gonna want to die quick. Right. So it made sense that uh, that she goes out of her way to uh, to kill them. And I also liked what she did with the villagers. She wasn't mad at them or anything. In fact, she gave them some money or something for, you know, treating an old green bone the right way. It's kind of cool how the call family just throws money around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's pretty whatever. It's just like something that I noticed. They're always like handing people little envelopes of cash. Yeah. It just adds to the whole mystique of everything and just like, you know, how how powerful and important this this family is and just like they're just always kind of grease and bombs just a nice yeah. touch to everything it is it's very like um you know old gangster like chicago boston thug family gangster family before we head into the next synopsis i just i just really quickly want to talk about andon oh yeah and we're going to talk about andon a lot more in the next section but i think andon is my favorite character right now same. Like my favorite character in the last book was a, a kind of a tie between Lan and Shay, but Andon is just a delight. He really, that's the only word I can think of for it. He's just, he's like yeah. the realest character in this whole series, which is saying a lot because a lot of the characters are very real. He's so honest and he's such a good person. It's like, like genuinely good. He really is trying. And he's been traumatized like repeatedly. Yeah, like, I'm traumatized from hearing about his trauma. You don't have to take that kind of trauma in stride. You shouldn't be expected to, even though he is kind of being expected to by, <laughs> by Hilo. But, I mean, he's he still wants to serve his family in whatever way he can. Like, he doesn't necessarily consider himself uh, a green bone, but he still considers himself a call. He still adheres to the honor system, the good parts of it. I just really admired his ability to kind of like make the best of a situation he wasn't really into. He d he didn't want to be there at all. Mm -hmm. You know, even when he's landing on the plane, he's just like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, I don't want to do this. Like he had, he had like this cushy job, you know, on the beach and he, <laughs> you know, it's like, it really went into detail, like how fine he was with where he was at, but he takes it in stride and he, he meets cool people and he starts learning more about this other country, which is what he's there to do. It's just such a great character. Though he doesn't want to do it, he immediately builds the mindset to make the most of the situation. Okay, I'm not going to be messing around. I'm going to actually learn this. He starts practicing the language, just doing all the right things because he just has a good heart. And the whole reason why he doesn't want to be a green bone is because he knows he'll like his, he likes it too much. 
Like he's denying <laughs> himself. He knows it because he's like, I don't want to become that person that truly is evil. And it's like, man, you're such a good guy. We'll get to more of Andon in the next synopsis, which I think we're ready for. All right. In Port Massey, Andon gets into a fight with a low-level member of one of the city's crews. After learning of this and informing Andon that dueling is illegal, the Heons take Andon to the local pillar to help resolve the conflict. He agrees to help, and Andon makes friends with his son, Cory. Shay meets with Espenian military officials and denies their request for Jade, but offers up the location of some of the shine factories run by the mountain in Egoton. Hilo travels to Steppenland to confront Aini. He tries to convince her to return to Kikon so Nico can be raised as a greenbone. While away, the Espenians invade Eastern Shotar, escalating the fighting to full-scale war. Hilo, now desperate to return to Kikon, tries once more to convince Aini to return to Kikon. After she refuses him and insults him, he kills her and returns home with Lan's son. His own son is born shortly after. Andon learns of the Kekanese underground community in Espania, and in a steamy turn of events, his friendship with Cory becomes a romance. Leading an illegal jade scavenging crew, Barrow and Mutt are confronted by mountain greenbones. The mountain clan Horn spares the boys' lives, telling Barrow he wishes to speak with his boss. Months later, he is offered a chance to assassinate a greenbone, but refuses. Make Ken attacks a jade smuggling cargo ship, beginning a campaign to prevent the underground jade smuggling market from growing and aiding their enemies. Utilizing Shay's information, Espenia destroys numerous shine factories. Shay introduces Maro to her family. Maro and Hilo disagree about the future and utility of jade, and Hilo, though supportive of the relationship, requests that Shay ask his permission should she wish to marry. Eight Mata leaks Shay's involvement to the press, using her past dealings with Espinia as evidence. Rumors spread about Shay's inability as weatherman, and Hilo is asked to remove Shay from the position. Hilo refuses, his disappointment obvious. Hilo begins courting clans loyal to the Mountain Clan, offering support to lower ranking members should they wish to remove Eight Mata. Shay aids a lantern man in buying significant pieces of land in Espania, looking to strengthen the clan via external alliances. She learns she is pregnant, but knowing this will cause even more internal strife for the clan and decides upon a plan of action. Okay, so everybody's pregnant. Everybody's pregnant. We're having babies. <laughs> We're having babies. Babies on babies on babies. <laughs> Turns out my green boner reference was not so far off the mark. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, that that was a that was weird. Yeah. It wasn't bad so or anything, yeah. but I was definitely like, oh, oh, another baby. Uh, yeah. Also, is... uh Fonda's getting a little steamier in this, but yeah. she's enjoying <laughs> writing these scenes a little bit. You're thinking you're, yeah. you're gonna get like a and they made love passionately under the pale moonlight sort of thing, but no, no. You get a whole couple pages of like steamy in depth. We're doing spice, people. Yeah. We got, got some spice. spice. I did close the window because uh, I was listening to some of it on tape <laughs> <laughs> and there was like some some real steaminess going on and i had it really loud because i was like focused and <laughs> doing that and listening and you know there's like neighbor kids and stuff and i was like oh sorry neighborhood these are people yeah you know they have sex even andon's little run in i was like okay and yeah exactly i was yeah, so happy it, for andon yeah you know and, and i think i was kind of right about this that we were going to start seeing a lot more of the general populace yeah you were right you called that i'm so into it because i didn't want this to just be this thing where it was just these two clans for three books just going at it and just scheming against each other and that would have gotten old like pretty fast but yep. andon is it's not like andon is hanging out in john loon he goes to another city where there are kekanese people but they're kind of like intermingled with the espenians Right, so there's like this clash of culture there, and it's so much more interesting to read about. You know, like the 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 stuff in in Kekon and in Jan Loon and stuff is already interesting, but throwing this little twist on it and then having Andon, who has grown up 
with all of these customs his entire life, like move to a different area of the world to see how other people are living. It's just great. I couldn't agree more. It gives us a chance to see the other parts of the world, but there's enough Kikinese culture that it's not totally foreign and new and like, oh my gosh, now I have to learn an entire new situation. It's like, no, no, you're just kind of learning an augmented, twisted one and it's close enough to still be home and, and within the alignment of the book and not force me to learn too much and get all these information dumps, but different enough that I'm like, okay, this is fresh. This is good. Um, have you ever heard the idea that in order for a person to become fully adult, their parent has to die? No. I think it's originally like the line goes, you know, a son cannot become a real man, a full grown man until his father dies. Um, but I think you oh. could use it with any gender and that like, you don't quite know who you are and what you and how you will react when the automatic authority goes away. There is no one else that you just kind of do what they say because ipso facto, you know, and that Andin is kind of experiencing that. So it's not necessarily like your direct parent has to die, but like he's not near Hilo and right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. He gets, he gets the separation that he needed and to become his own person. And that's going to be important later on in the book. That's a cool notice. I didn't even think about that. Thank you. One thing I did notice about these end in chapters too, is that it's kind of a good way of showing that maybe the customs in Jan Loon aren't the end all be all you know what i mean because there's i didn't um, think about that yeah because like uh, and i noticed and i don't know if this was intentional but i thought it was a pretty nice touch is that they're down in the basement and like there's all this kick and these food and stuff but there's still this bowl of candy that is a spenny and candy oh yeah and he's like i can't understand why people think that's but good. they're but they're eating it you know and yeah. i think that I th and i don't know if this was intentional or not but i thought it was a really good way to show that you know, while these people are Kekanese, they're they are with everybody else in this right. big city. Stay open minded enough to see the value in other things. Right, exactly. Yes. And I think it's purposeful now that you point that out. That's a good notice. I just it's I think that it's just like such a big part of these books that I, I keep coming back to that point. Um and it's showcased too in the conversation between Maro and Hilo when Shay brings Maro to dinner. Maro's kind of like, well, I mean, like, you know, the prohibition on jade is what's creating this black market. Yeah, and it's like usually kind of founded in like old religious ideas and dogma. <laughs> and he kind of like points out a lot of kind of like what I've been saying. It's like, you know, if you you can keep clinging to these traditions all you want, but it doesn't really seem to be benefiting everybody. You know, right. and, and Hilo is just kind of like, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> and in addition, you know, he specifically says that because of their stranglehold on the jade market, it's allowing these criminal organizations to rise up, have power, and do crime. It was a really weird, and not weird, I guess, but I wasn't expecting Hilo to kind of, you know, and it's just showing us even more that Hilo's yeah, not... Be so chill. He was just like, you know what, if you want to, you know, he's, he's better than the last guy, <laughs> is basically what he <laughs> says. <laughs> he's just like, man, Shay, I mean, like, you keep keep bringing people that aren't full-fledged green bones i guess that's not your thing so like at least he's got some jade and he's not in the at Spanian, least he's so. Kekinese. <laughs> yeah but <laughs> though uh, he doesn't but, know but yeah Mero uh tells shay that he's like half shatari sh shatari yeah they're just like if you're not Kekinese, you're shit it makes sense that they're as exclusionary as they are because of the history of that island you know like it's been invaded it's been like it's almost like Jan Loon and by extension the rest of Kekon has finally kind of settled into this uh, autonomy. They're kind of like free from the 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 oppression of the other countries surrounding them. And so now they've got this opportunity to kind of like be this strong unified Kekon, which is ostensibly what the Mountain Clan wants, but that's not really what they want. Like they're, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're assholes, but like it's it is really interesting to observe, you know, on from the outside it probably does look like yeah, like they're they're very um like kind of elitist, mm -hmm. you know. Like Hilo's just like I only want green bones up in here. Like I don't want any of these. I don't want any of these Shatari people. Like I don't want any. Of, but the the island has grown strong because, or at least he thinks, because of a lot of those um, mindsets. He's probably not wrong. You know, I mean, I think I kind of see uh, Kikan as the the honey mat badger of this planet. You know, it's tiny. It's like if New Zealand had wizards. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Not just really scary spiders. <laughs> Kekanese people have been through a lot. But that's also like, it's like this other thing where it's like, I don't even really, st I still don't really believe that either the Mountain Clan or No Peak like really cares that much about Kekan, like as an island. Like they say they do, but through their actions, like it just doesn't really feel like it. Yeah, they're about like the power that they have and making sure that they still are like the Jade peeps. Maybe I'm reading this 100% wrong. Right. But like, I haven't seen any real, like, sincere attempt at unifying the clans. And like, even after their attempt, he's like, all right, guys, we all know that was totally bullshit. We are yeah. absolutely <laughs> going to get vengeance upon them. But that was a question that I had actually. It was like, so, um, Hilo is kind of talking to these other families, right? Because they're trying to depose I Mata. Mm hmm. But like, what's the plan after that? Like, that's kind of like what I was confused about. It's like, so he gets this, you know, um, like the Ven family. He talks to that guy on the boat, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just like, hey, you know, we will totally throw in with you if you can, like, do a coup and get Ait Mata out of there. But it's just like, all right, but then do you, don't you still kind of like have the Mountain Clan to deal with? Or is it yes, just a more but manageable? He helped them. Yeah, because he helped them. They're like going into it as allies they're gonna be more but that's so i don't know man like it's just I mean, like... the whole point of the clans isn't to like have this hierarchy it's to control jade and kind of be like a almost like a police force yeah i know but it's just like like why would like you know that guy ven i don't remember the for his first name but the guy on the boat right right he's like in charge of like the biggest freight and shipping company in sando the whole... ven sando what's to stop him with all the resources that he has from doing the same thing that I, I just I don't see like how this could really resolve into anything, you know. It's like yeah, a little bit of time. It's like a band aid, almost. Yeah, and I just don't see why it's like such gap. a big priority. Like I mean, I guess it's like a harm reduction to a certain extent. At least get Aitmata out of there because she's obviously just insane. You right. Know what I mean, like, and I, I mean, don't maybe think... not obviously. You know what I mean? Uh, like she's she's she's, uh, she's ruthless. Yes, she's ruthless. Well said. Yeah. And I don't think Hilo nor Shay expects then sando to be successful i think that all he's trying to do is just drill holes in the foundation of their clan so the structure overall is weaker so when yeah. he goes to actually push on it the building falls down i right? think you're totally right about that because i think there yeah. is a line there is a line there where he's just kind of like yeah well like, like this is going to shake things up for them yeah and he whatever. says like them him and his son combined aren't half the pillar that right. she is you're totally you know? right okay okay cool that's on me Sometimes no, you uh, <laughs> sometimes you forget uh, one sentence that <laughs> really that really matters. matters. Yeah. But I mean, no, I mean in your defense though, like even if he does that with five different people and one of them, you know, it might actually work. There is a lot of unhappiness it seems in the Mountain Clan, and eventually he will have to face this whole problem again with someone else. It's all stopgap solutions it seems so you're not wrong in thinking that by any means well and yeah is what, what's that old saying it's like um you know better to deal with the devil that you know yeah um, but the devil that they know is like i said completely Super ruthless devil. and is you know that conversation that she had with shay in the first book where she's just like i'm going to kill all of you like I'm... <laughs> it's like okay maybe we can't reason with that person yeah. maybe we could she's reason like casually with... like first we kill your brother which yeah. is reasonable needs to happen <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't gonna kill lan okay god <laughs> Oh god! I just she wanted is, to kill uh... Hilo because he's annoying. <laughs> yeah. He's really difficult. He's emotional, and I don't like that. There are a couple things that I'm having just like a little bit of trouble. Um, okay, good. Kind Me of too. Understand. Okay, like maybe it's this. Maybe we have the same thing, or hopefully we have different things. Um, that would be ideal. Yeah. Hopefully so. I'm just. I'm a little bit confused with Shay's dealings with the Espenians. I don't understand why it's beneficial for Espenia to destroy the SN1 supplies or factories or whatever well this is okay this is my understanding and it could be wrong i could be totally totally wrong here but i she never mentioned that those are mountain clan shine facilities she just said that they're egoton egotinian shine facilities because the mountain clan has put those factories on egoton because they obviously can't have big old shine factories here yeah. so in an attempt to for the mountain clan to ally with egoton they're like okay let me have some shine factories on 
your land. And so Espenia thinks that they're taking out a major uh, Egotinian um, factory, you know, that's uh, giving them a bunch of money. So you're saying that Espenia doesn't know that it's the mountain clans shine. So it's yeah, beneficial, and, for, like both of them almost. Exactly. Okay, and even I if see. they do know, it's still beneficial because like, I'm sure Egoton's not getting nothing out of letting the mountain, mountain clan have okay, those factories there. Totally. They're still getting some sort of economic boon or some shine on the side, you know? Okay. Yeah. That was something that I was just kind of like, I was having a little bit of trouble with that. And then a little kind of related to that. Um, this isn't something that I was having trouble with, but just something that I noticed, which is really interesting is that I eat Mata really seems to understand how to, how to manipulate the press. Yeah. It's so cool having a fantasy series where there is a thing like journalists and yeah. uh, newspapers and stuff. You don't see it that. catches me off bunch. guard sometimes. Yeah, I know. Like, like, and like, aircraft carriers. Like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I know they get into a plane and I'm just like, uh, yeah, oh. planes. Oh, okay, totally, okay. totally. Totally. Dragons are better, but well, yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Big jade dragons. Oh, yes. <laughs> the plane should be made out of jade. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she and she uses it very effectively. Very effectively. I mean, to the point where we've got a lot of p different people kind of trying to get Shay, which is which is a really good example of how you can sway public opinion against their own interests, right? Because like Shay is obviously the only person that can do this job. Right. She's keeping the clan together. It's really difficult to watch yeah. the the tide of public affection kind of sway and mm -hmm. turn away from her, even though she's kind of doing everything. She's not doing everything right, but she's doing it better than anybody else in her position would do. Absolutely. And it's so effective. It's not even just swaying public opinion. It's swaying the opinion of high up people in the No Peak clan, right? He gets... Um... Oh, that was one of my other questions. You're leading right into it. Hami, the master luck bringer yes did i miss something because did it show hami having a problem with her not killing doru or was this just something that we did he like go behind shay's back and talk to hilo was that part of that scene i don't think i it don't was. think so no i don't think so i don't remember it if it did then we both didn't notice something but no i think it's just something that's implied and you're just like it's just a thing it's pretty that weak happened. that's yeah it's pretty weak because he could have just talked, you know, like, this is kind of like what you were talking about before, of just like this kind of like toxic atmosphere within this clan structure, because it's like, she's a weatherman, like, why don't you just talk to her and ask what was going through her brain, maybe, or like, or right. like, you know what I mean? And like, maybe that's not the way that they do things. You know, you're supposed to just go around the weatherman and go straight to the pillar and say, I don't think the weather is it even his yeah. place to say that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Hilo, good on him, gets kind of pissed off. And he doesn't get pissed off at the other two, but he specifically gets pissed off at him being like, you should know better to not be trusting the outsiders and especially the press. Come on. <laughs> it's true, though, as Hilo and Shay are attempting to kind of like shake up the foundations of the mountain clan. So too, is that happening to no peak from, you know, so yeah. like from the inside, you know, but they're just doing, they're using different methods to be mm -hmm. able to do that. So that's pretty interesting to watch. I think at some point over the next, I have a small prediction here that I just thought of. I think at some point over the next, uh, you know, hundred pages or so, we're going to see uh, what's his, the, the captain of the ship guy that Hilo was talking to. Uh, Ven Vensando. Uh, we're going to see his head on a stake somewhere yeah. around the city. <laughs> just like casually, we're going to be like driving yeah. around. He's just going to be like hanging off of a wall, you know? <laughs> yeah, I kind of got that same vibe. Like, I don't think yeah. this guy's going to be alive for very much longer. He was running his mouth. Yeah, and there's there's just no way. Like, they've built up Aitmata so much over the last book and a half. There's no way that they're just going to be able to just oust her like that. No. Like, that's going to fail. At least no. I, I think it is. Oh, I agree completely. Um, you know, something I was wrong on was that I thought in this book we were going to get a whole lot more exposure to the other clans, and there has been not one mention <laughs> of them I mean, at I like all. It. There's been other families, but yeah, not other clans. Yeah. That is interesting. Okay, so help me understand something here, um, and it's not the same thing that uh, the question that hey. I have that I'm confused on, so yay. Uh, okay, who the hell is allied with who? Give me the war thing. I know Espinia and Egoton are not friends, but then there's like, Sh Shotar, Shitar, and Wawawiwu, and the Wawiwians. 
<laughs> oh yeah, you're listening to the Help audio book. So I have, am listening to much, a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. We have much different pronunciations for stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so my understanding is that Shatar and Igatan are having a bit of a land dispute over a region of eastern Shatar called Ortoko. Espenia is allied with Shatar, and Kikan is allied with Espenia. I think you have that wrong. I think Espenia is allied with... I think Egotan is allied with Shatar. No, that's not That's not what's going no, on. No, it's not? No. Oh, man, see, I'm uh, so confused. From what I understand, Egotan is kind of, like, fairly isolated. I mean, I guess they seem to have some kind of very um, faint sort of connection with the mountain clan but it seems to be like strictly business not like a not like an army kind of exchange okay. or anything like that um they don't have like troop support or, or anything like that but i from what i gather egaton is basically alone in this they're a third party they're they're not i mean they're not a third party but it's just like it's like egaton versus shatar espenia and kikon i think kikon is like loosely allied with Espania. Espania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I understand. Kikan is like the um the cash cow um for Jade. I think that Espania has more resources to protect Kikan from Egatan. And I think even okay. Shatar, like I mean, because Kikan was at war with Shatar before all of this started. Like Shatarians right. were occupying Kikan, and I think the uh Uwi Uwiwu uh, Uwiwa oh, Islands. <laughs> Try and hear, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, I think I think that is kind of the state of things right now. And then, like, there is a part where um, Espenia kind of starts rolling tanks through like eastern Shatar and stuff. Where? How does Espenia play into this? Who are they fighting, and why? I think Espenia is fighting Egaton because they're allied with Shatar. That seems to me to be okay. The, what's going on because of the land dispute? Yes. But okay. it's 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 very strange because I feel like that was kind of just thrown at us. Yeah. Like I'm sure it was mentioned in Jade City, but we were still trying to get our bearings with everything that was going on in Jan Loon. So anytime it was mentioned, we were I was just kinda of like whatever. But now it's like a big deal. You know, it's like a full war by the part where we're at in the book. And who begins the war? Who starts it? Well, sorry, when he was away. It looks like Espenia like invades. At least that's okay. what's like on the news, okay, or whatever. And then like I, I Mata comes out, you know, and gives her press conference, and that's why Shay calls Hilo, and he's she's just like, you got to get here right now because you are nowhere to be seen, you know. Like I Mata's over here just saying all this like, you know, political posturing and you know, putting on a really good face for the public, and you're just out grabbing babies. <laughs> you're on a baby run. Uh <laughs> okay, well, thank you for explaining that to me. I'm still a little confused, but that helped me so much more than that. I'm so much more less. Confused. Yeah, I mean, like I'm a little confused about that too, but it'll probably develop. Yeah, like we're doing a podcast where we haven't read everything, so you know, we gotta kind of like speculate on stuff, and we're probably gonna be wrong yeah. about stuff. But you know, this isn't as confusing as some of the other stuff that we've read. So certainly not. Oh, one, I think it's nice for anyone listening who is confused to get a little like validation. Like you're not the only one who's confused, and. If they are confused, then maybe, you know, your answer there could help clear it up a little bit. Like, I certainly understand more. Yeah, but I don't even know if I'm, like, 100% right. <laughs> it's like, I'm pretty sure I am. Like, if I if I really felt sounds like I was... Sounds right. Yeah, it sounds right. <laughs> we'll correct ourselves in the uh, in the second episode. Yeah. Um, before we go, there was another thing that I really wanted to talk about. Was it um, Hilo murdering <laughs> yeah that was what i wanted to talk about. in freaking cold blood <laughs> i mean I he did it really light listening to that and i was like ah! he did it Freaked really out. gently yeah it was a gentle murder <laughs> i mean like that was yeah that was pretty gruesome because he like he like kills her and puts her on the couch and then grabs the kid, and the kid's just like, Mama! And he's just like, she's just sleeping. And it's just like, Jesus. Like, this is... <laughs> he, like, kind of has this post 
murder justification process where he's like, yeah, I tried, tried to convince yeah. her, but whatever. But he's like, not very, he's not bent out of shape about it at all. And it's also like, and I know I've touched, I've touched on this point so many times on this episode, but it's also like just another really good example of like, it's not necessary. Like you're so hell bent on this kid being raised <laughs> as a green bone when he has a perfectly acceptable life where he's at right now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's got his, it's like two parents that seem to really love him, even though it's a little messy because it's not that other guys like he, what well, he has to murder two completely innocent people just yes. to get this kid where he wants this. It's like, man, that Birth, is a birthright. Nope. Didn't like that. That was some, yeah, no, I kind of lost a little love for Hilo who's been kind of my dude. I really like the Hilo juice. And I noticed too, that like Shay, I was expecting some sort of like admonishment or like, some kind of like yeah. consequence or at least like shade to like yell at him and just say like what the hell are you doing but like nope two months goes by and nope. he's just eating fucking nectarines and shade's just like ah, i love this little kid it's just like wait yeah. what <laughs> yeah he murdered when, her. Too. she's like she's like well i didn't really like his methods but hey i do love that kid <laughs> like it was yeah I, I, are there gonna be consequences to that like this i don't know and i kind of think it was like was that out of character for him or maybe am i just had a different understanding of really what he's capable of uh, he immediately blames the person who got raped for wearing a low-cut shirt sort of he's like well she was really poking the tiger right i warned her what yeah. was going to happen when she insulted a jade bone warrior of my stature and then it's like man he blamed her for him murdering her i mean Hilo is just he's a really excellent character and not excellent in the way that he's a really stand up guy all the time but he's just a really complicated person you know and mm -hmm. it's like such a great character to read like i still don't know <laughs> I mean, if i thought i knew what Hilo was gonna do next I, I i was very wrong yeah and this story could take a turn because if he starts doing a lot more things like that this could become a we need change sort of story and Andin could learn about new different cultures and come in with a new healthy perspective and you know end up fighting Hilo to take over the clan and change Whoa. the ways like who knows you know who knows but if he does this too many more times I don't know in the spirit of that prediction uh do you have any predictions for the the rest of this book something that I really want to see that's, that's and right. that is before the story is over i want to see one of the temple guys who spends all day just like caressing the ginormous bowling ball of jade <laughs> freaking go at it with somebody i want them to defend their temple somehow and just like unleash the wrath of the jade gods because obviously they spend like all day you know shay's like they must hear like a fly buzzing like being in touch with that much jade yeah. and they do it in like three round shifts all of their life They've got to be powerful. I didn't even think about that. That would. Uh, I want to see them. <laughs> For some reason, ass. I just like don't think that's going to happen. I don't know why. I know. <laughs> I don't either, but I want to see it's it. It's like such a specific thing you want to see. <laughs> oh, every time she goes to the temple, I'm like, oh, we get another opportunity. Maybe yeah. someone's going to piss one of those guys off. Uh, do you have any predictions? Um. So the end of the last chapter, when Shay finds out she's pregnant, she kind of like thinks a lot and seems to kind of come to some sort of decision at the end of that chapter yeah and what i think is going to happen is that she's going to tell woon that woon needs to like say the baby is his bro i don't know like because that's exactly cause, what's going to happen i don't that's know perfect like, because that that yeah okay because because like woon and we didn't put it in the um the recap but woon has feelings for shay and he even to the point where he wants to quit being her, her shadow for the weatherman because he thinks it's going to get in the way of what he's trying to do and then she tells him like you're the only one that can do this job i need you to be here just like put your feelings for me aside and doesn't Hilo say something about um woon has is like proposing to his girlfriend or something right yeah like in a chapter or two yeah after so they kind of resolve could... their thing so that's what's making me think like I could be wrong. No, but I think that maybe I think that they would have they probably would have said something about how to like have some kind of abortion or something, right? Like yeah, that's they, what I was thinking. She resolved. I mean, that could was resolved that, to do. That very well could be what happens, but we haven't heard like mm -hmm. anything about that. And like, why set up Woon having all that affection for Shay and just have it like not really go anywhere? Like, I could see Shay 
going to Woon and saying like, all right, here's what we're going to do. Like, you're a full-fledged green bone. We can't have any scandals in here. Like, we, you know, you and me are going to have to, like, maybe she has to, like, marry Woon or something. Um, and Woon has to, like, publicly say that this is his baby or something. I don't, and obviously none of that could happen, you know. But it's just, it makes yeah. sense. Like, some of those pieces really do. It makes really so do. much sense. When you said that, it was like when you told me at the end of your prediction of Lycanius, where you're like, yeah, I think that that might have been, um, what's his face inside? You made a prediction at the end of Lycanius, and it just, the whole rest of the book lined up for me in my brain. I was like, yeah. whoa, that was the missing piece. Boom, it just rang with truth. That is the same moment I just had with that. That's Because ex- you're right. It, we, we don't even know if abortion's a thing in this world. Um, they've never, th- there's been no foundational groundwork laying of that coming about, whether it's cool, whether it's not cool. Um, but there has been foundation of the wound thing. So mm, I, if she doesn't, she's going to hear this podcast and be like, dang it. That was, good. <laughs> that was a good idea. I just <laughs> yeah. wrote this scene where, it... <laughs> um, yeah. but like, I don't know. It, it it is it's a bad place for Shay to be, right? Because like they can't afford another scandal. Like they can't. Right. Af- like what if what if it got out that Maru, Maro, uh, the guy, uh, that's, the Maro. teacher, the teacher that she's dating, Maro. Like what if it got out that he was like half Kekanese or something? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then it's just like this big dust up, and everyone's upset, and it's like like Maro as and they they really built up Maro too that she like really likes him a lot. I don't know. Oh, and speaking of people that like each other a lot, nothing better happened to Corey. Okay. Oh yeah, like, he's a cool guy. I like Corey a lot. Anden has been through too much. Okay. Right. Just, yeah, and how's just... Corey not in, like in a band? You know, he's so cool. He <laughs> he should be in a band. I know. There's like that part where it's like, uh, and then Corey came in and he's like leaning back in his chair and he's got like some <laughs> cool T-shirt on. It's just like, oh, uh, Anden. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh. Anden's so smitten. <laughs> He really um, is. But nothing better. I, I, There's two characters in this in these books that I don't want to see anything bad happen to. And it, it's Wen and Corey. Like, nothing better happened to Wen. Nothing mm-hmm. better happened to Corey. I like those two characters quite a bit. And But you know something's going to happen to Wen. <laughs> something's going to happen to... The only way I'm... to make Hilo explode off the handle is for something bad to happen to Wen. A win incident to occur. Yeah, oh, I can boy. See or his that kid. Helen. No. Or both. It wouldn't be the kid. No, no, because I do think there will be uh, someone to carry on the next phase of, of Greenbones. Well, I think it's going to okay. be Andon. Yeah, yeah. I think Andon right. I mean, is going to end him, up being yeah. the pillar of, of No Peak by the end of this series. I agree completely. And completely. Or, I mean, it could be, it could be, um, like Nico or Rue or or whoever, but eventually uh, you know, it might be one of them. But I think, I think right, the book series is going to end. Yeah, yeah. I think like a if I was going to make a huge prediction for these books, I think Hilo's going to die at some mm-hmm. point. Like Hilo's totally going to die. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so epic. Hilo fighting well, maybe is my not. favorite things to read about. Uh, okay, so before we wrap here, I've got one notice and one question, and uh, and then we can call it a night here. So first, the notice. Um, Barrow, and both of them have to do with Barrow here. I really enjoy the the window we get into Barrow's thought process because he's growing. He's kind of dumb sometimes, and he's really caught up in like the masculinity thing that we've referred to him multiple times. Um, you know, he's like ridiculous sometimes on the verge of killing like the only person that he could kind of call a friend. He's like, I've got the high ground. Hmm, should I kill him? Like right at the beginning of the book, you know. He's like standing over him in the grave. It's like, wow, you're just going to kill your friend because why not? You don't really see much value in them. But then later on, he like realizes that Mutt is his friend and I think apologizes for being mean yeah. to him. Yeah. I'm like, wow, we've come a long way. Like 200 pages ago, you were like, well, should I kill him just because you have the high ground? Like what? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I like that we get to see that. But my question is. Where the hell is this? What's his purpose to this story? He's so adrift for some unknown reason. We're still being kept up to speed with this super unimportant character. I get while he what purpose he served in the first book, but I have zero idea why we're still with him now. Do you have any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think that kind of like the sentiment that I had in the last couple of podcasts where it's just like Barrow and the other Jade Smugglers are the people that are trying to get ahead 
power filters down and like the desire for power is not just for the people at the top. We have people that are scrabbling and clutching at power on every step of this ladder, you know, and I, I think that's that's what Barrow's for, you know, it's like it's not it's not just these two clans. It's not just these countries. It's not just this jade supply that's going to the top elites. You know, there's there's different pockets and different factions that are trying to get everything that they can. And because of that, it's having ripple effects on everything else that's happening. So it's like Barrow is very important to everything. Barrow's a very brilliant character. You know, like everything that's going on <clears throat> with him is uh, very necessary because that's how it would happen. You know, like this, it wouldn't it wouldn't just be fenced in around the people that are already in power in this kind of conflict. That was a really yeah. good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I expect you to be like, well, he's probably going to be used for like the vehicle for this character to do some other thing. And you like got deep with that. You're like, well, he represents the common man and how yeah. <laughs> the struggle between two hierarchies. Wow. So that was a really good answer, Evan. But I mean, like that's, that's in, that's in every conflict, you know? And like, yeah, was you're very, totally right. it's a, it was very um, smart of Fonda Lee to like consider that. Yeah. You know? Why wouldn't he? Well, I, I would, you know, if there, if there was some like priceless, gem in Oregon that like if I found it like if I found this gem like you know that's millions of dollars all, all I gotta do is have it like I don't even have to use it like he wants to <laughs> use it obviously but like right. he's got enough jade it's just why like Pharaoh it's like come on man, Pharaoh, like, you, come on, man. <laughs> like you have enough jade that you could just you could sell it you could figure out a way to sell it even like piece by piece and just like fuck off you know and just oh, let he's these... itching for more yeah, though he, yeah and that's the nature of jade and addiction because right, let's face yeah. it the green bones are drug addicts <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean i guess you <laughs> from <can>. birth <laughs> but they're able to handle it yeah you know but like barrow high he... functioning but like and i think it's like it's smart to have like sn1 is also addictive there's also right. side effects to taking it. There's also withdrawals. There's, you know what I mean? So it's like, not only do you have to take this drug, you have to take another drug to be able to <laughs> use this drug, you right. know? So it's this, it's very, very indicative of how the lower class needs to work even harder yeah. to get ahead and has more consequences for trying to get ahead when there's already this power structure in place. With 10 sentences, you changed my thought process on the butt, on the, on the butt, on the Barrow character from this is entirely pointless to wow, how brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on you and uh, Fonda. Well done. All right, everyone. That's going to wrap up our recap of part one of Jade War. We have a whole nother section of this book and a whole nother book after it. So obviously, Chad and I. We might have just been wasting our time with this. Like we could have been wrong about literally everything. It's totally possible, but that's where the fun is at. You know, like this is the cool part of this is you know we get to talk about it with each other. Hopefully, the people that are reading this are enjoying us kind of going back and forth and giving you our predictions and our thoughts. And while maybe we could be talking out our asses a little bit about this, <laughs> the speculation is such a blast, and I'm really so happy fun. that you could all be here with us. Yeah, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Uh, man, I think uh, the shaking of our snow globe is <laughs> is upon us. It's coming, globe. man. It's coming. <laughs> and the third book is just going to be one riotous blizzard, and it's going to be great. I'm really yeah, looking forward to it. I really think that the end, like, I mean, like I said at the beginning of this episode, like obviously um, it was a little slow for me. Like I really enjoyed yeah. um, the characters, and, and I think that they're developing even more. But there was a lot of sitting around tables and talking to each other. And, um, yeah. I, and I think that it was necessary. I'm glad that it happened. And I think that the end of this book is going to be just out of control. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. It's like we can sit through a few negotiations about real estate uh, deals, but, you know, let's let's get on. And I can't wait to find out not only how this book ends, but how it sets up book three. That's what I'm that's what I'm really interested in, because, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we have a whole and I think Jade City's longer. Like Seven hundred, yeah. yeah. I wonder if there's gonna be a time gap between the books. I don't think so. Yeah, actually. I was I wondering think, that myself. I think this yeah. one's gonna end on a cliffhanger of like what, and then the third one's gonna be like right then picking it up. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support Book Reviews Kill, please click on the link to our Patreon in the description for this episode. There, you can also find the link to our Discord. Join the conversation there, not only in the many threads available, but also in our dedicated Greenbone channel. Some excellent conversation is happening there. And if you would like to join me in the audiobook Listen of Jade City, there is a link to Audible and two free credits in the description below. Everybody, have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks for listening. Bye, everybody.